completed. Oh, before we do, um, I will just mention this. As, um, as COVID um, and the virus has hit us, a lot of our communications have just changed and um, we've done a lot of um, communication and streamlined them through uh, the weekly webinar. So I would ask that um, you would change your name in your Zoom so that we could see who is here as well as put the network you're participating with. So put your name and your network if you don't mind. It's a way for one. It's best practice, I guess, when it comes to our virtual world and um, being engaging in this virtual activity or, or virtual experience, right? But um, also it lets us know which networks are actually present here in, um, in lead, this lead agency um, webinar, right? So that um, we also know if we need to send out um, additional emails covering information. It just lets us know who attends um, the weekly webinar. We really do appreciate you taking care of this for us. I also would add in enrollment office hours, we only have two left. This is one of the strategies to really engage um, your participants, our families, and also putting in, and this particular um, visual as well as the words, allows you to um, take that digital space and make it just a little bit more intimate. And then you get a chance to um, call people by their first name. You could also make this, um, instead of names, make it initials. All right, so we're gonna move straight to Lindsay Branford, and she is going to get us started on eligibility. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay, cool. Um, so we're going to do today a little bit of a um, shortened version of what we usually cover every year, because a lot of this is a reminder for everyone. Um, when we send out, or not send out, but we will post on the website the new family eligibility worksheet, and there will be a more in-depth um, PDF of uh, determination instructions located there as well. So this is just sort of an abbreviated version. So um, as you all know, the children that we serve must meet the, the economically disadvantaged definition. And currently in Louisiana, that definition is for is families who fall at 200 or percent below the federal poverty level. Um, when they fall within that income limit, then they are el uh, eligible for pre-K programs. And we also include children in foster care and um, children experiencing homelessness or in a temporary living situation. They are categorically eligible. Children with special needs or English language learners may be able to receive these services, but they have to be income eligible to participate in one of the pre-K programs. So they, they can still get special services for whatever their um, needs are, but they do have to meet the income requirements to participate in LA4 or NSCCD. Okay, um, we wanna be really clear about what eligibility requirements are. Um, children should not be deemed ineligible for pre-K for any reason other than the in income of the family and the child's age. This would include any kind of medical issue, including potty training, um, guardianship issues, um, whether or not they can purchase uniforms, transportation, religion, ethnicity, cultural practices, or language barriers. And um, should a school system or a provider site consider it necessary to prevent a child from enrolling or consider disenrolling a child for any reason, they should communicate with the child's family what service limitations they may face. For example, a non-public school may not be able to provide um, specific medical services that a child may need, or um, they may not have staff that can assist in that child's home language. Um, they should have these conversations with the family. So 
there is a plan in place for supporting the, ch the child to receive educational services and in collaboration with the family document in writing how the site will best meet the child's needs. Okay, so there's three, well, really there's two actual, like we said, eligibility criteria, age and income. Um, and then we are gonna just touch on immunizations briefly. Um, as it's not a requirement for eligibility, but it is a requirement for starting school. Okay, age requirements. The law requires that children who participate in a publicly funded pre-K program be four years old by September 30th of their pre-K year. So for the 21-22 school year, a child would need to have a birthday that falls between October 1st of 2016 and September 30th of 2017 in order to be age eligible. A child's state issued or foreign birth certificate, current passport or visa should be collected to verify the date of birth. I want to note that the lack of a US state issued birth certificate should not be a deterrent from verifying a child's eligibility when a foreign birth certificate, passport or visa are available. You should also verify that the person completing the application is the parent listed on the birth certificate. If not, court issued documentation should also be submitted. This can come in the form of a custody judgment signed by a judge, a placement agreement from DCFS for child, uh, children in foster care, a provisional custody by mandate or a military power of attorney. And those two um, documents are legal forms which will need to be appropriately notarized to be valid. Families may also submit the non-legal custodian's affidavit, which does not grant legal custody, but allows a person other than the legal guardian to authorize educational services and school-related medical services for the named child if the parent is unable to be present. Okay, so we wanna talk about direct match first. And you can go to the next slide, Amanda. Um, the direct match system has proven to provide a fast and easy way to conduct eligibility determination. Um, I wanna reiterate that the data contained in direct match is confidential and must be protected. It's important to note that you will not be able to access children's or families' individual Medicaid or SNAP information, you will only be able to determine that a child is eligible for those services based on whether or not they are in the system. And just really quickly, um, by a show of hands, how many of you are using Direct Match and uh, really are seeing improved eligibility determination, improved speed of eligibility determination? I love it. Look at all the hands. Good job, guys. So I'm gonna read this really quick disclaimer um, just to make sure that we are being very clear um, about the confidentiality of direct match. Information included in eScholar is collected for the purpose of doing state and federal reporting, making data available to educators and other stakeholders and providing services to students. Student data are protected by state and federal laws and must be maintained in a confidential manner at all times. Unauthorized viewing, reproduction, copying, and or distribution of any student record or information outside the intended and approved use are strictly prohibited. Users violating the authorized use of the system and or data will lose access privileges to the system and or data. Illegal access or misuse of the information will be reported to the proper authority. That is our little disclaimer that they have us read just to make sure they're everybody understands they're real serious about it. So Lindsay, I think that is a testament to um, to families and almost a promise to families that, that their information is is confidential and um, communicating to families when they share their information um, via direct match and they're using and we're using this information that they that their information is private at all times. And that's a one, one good way to, to kind of confirm that with families, I think too. Yep, absolutely. Okay, 
So we're not going to go too in depth into the how to use direct match. I think most everybody on this call has had um, an individual technical assistance session. If you haven't, we can talk about how to do that. Um, this year we are requiring that all community networks gain access to and utilize direct match, which will allow you an easier method for determining child eligibility. Um, the login URL to access direct match is on the screen. And if you are unsure um, if you have access or if someone in your network has access, I know we've had a lot of new folks come in um, to some of the networks. Feel free to reach out to me. Um, we would definitely want to make sure each year that the correct people have access to the system and have received training on how to use it. Um, but the link to access the system is there. Um, if you need access, there's a quick form to fill out and then you can get a password pretty quickly. Um, and we are also happy to walk through the use of the system and provide additional guidance. Each network is allowed two users. So you may have two users within your school district if you're a lead agency that's a school district. Um, some places have one user in the school district and then one user who is an NSECD provider because they have a, it's a more rural area. Um, if you're a lead agency who is not a school system, typically there's one person who is within that lead agency and then one person within the school system. So you can split that up however you want, but we are only allowed to issue access to two users per network. Um, once logged in, it's a very quick process to perform the match. And again, I'm happy to walk through that with anyone who has not already had the TA session. If you are interested in a TA session, if you've already had one and you would like a refresher, or if you've not had one and you would like to, there is a link on this slide at the bottom where it says, please sign up for a time here. If you click that link, it will take you to a Google calendar. Um, TA sessions are offered every day at 11. So you just pick a day that works for you and, um, and we will hop on Zoom and go through the whole system, make sure you understand how to use it. I'm gonna pause just for a second to see if there's any questions. Does the non-legal custodial person have to live with the parent or can it be a grandmother that has all the documents? It can be anybody that, um, it can be anybody. It doesn't give them any kind of custody. It just is, um, let's say the, the mom is at work that day and can't get down to the school or to the district office or whatever it is to fill out the application you know, the grandmother or the aunt or somebody else can, can do that on their behalf. They just need to make sure they have the correct documentation. And are all districts allowed only two users regardless of size? Unfortunately, yes, our data governance team has restricted us to only two users per network. So even if you are um, a large school district, you have two users with access for your entire network. So that would include any children in, in your NSCCD programs. If you have NSCCD in your parish, um, it's two users per network. Are there any other questions about direct match before we move on? Okay, we can move to the next section, Amanda. Amanda, did we lose you? Oh, oh I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, there it is. I'm so sorry. Okay, no <laughs> problem. So during the eligibility determination process, and I should say this first, just because a child does not show up in direct match does not mean they are not eligible. Um, it just means that they do not receive food stamps or Medicaid because that's where that information is pulled from. So if they are not matched in direct match, you absolutely want to still check their, their eligibility the old fashioned way. So um, 
you can use any of these allowable forms of income verification and you can look at check stubs, current food stamp or SNAP benefit information, an official letter from their employer, which includes where they are employed, their hourly rate of pay, and the average number of hours that they work per week, a monetary determination for any unemployment benefits that they receive, a statement from the Social Security Administration verifying that the child listed on the application is the recipient of the SSI benef benefits, which if it is not the child that is listed um, and it is the parent or a grandparent, um, they would need to include any additional income. Okay, children in foster care are determined eligible with a current placement agreement for DC, from DCFS. If you, you receive a placement agreement from DCFS, that's all that child needs to be uh, determined eligible. Families living in a temporary, um, families in a temporary living arrangement due to the loss of housing or economic hardship um, should have their homeless status verified using the process that is already in place within your school district. So I think just about every school district has a homeless liaison or a McKinney-Vento liaison um, and you would need to utilize that process to determine um, homeless status for any child that is applying in your network. Tax forms including 1099s, W-2s, and tax returns are allowable as proof of income only when no other documentation exists. So in, a, in addition, you should only collect tax information for the most recent tax year. For example, in determining eligibility for 2021-2022, you would want to look at 2020 tax documentation. Your current, the current, which the taxes haven't even been filed yet. But if they have, um, if they have their W-9s or their W-2s, um, you can use that information. A statement of no income form should be completed by any adult household members who are claiming zero income of any kind. So if the family lives with a grandma who does not work or provide financial support to the family, this can be indicated on a statement of no income, which she will need to submit because she is an adult who is included in the household number. A declaration of employment form must be completed by any household adult members who are employed intermittently, who are self-employed, or who, for whatever reason, do not have any tax return forms, W-2s, check stubs, or applicable DCFS printouts to verify their income. So that's gonna be for somebody who um, maybe cuts hair in their home or um, cleans houses, who just has, um, you know, it's not, they don't get a regular check stub. They may be, they get paid cash, you know, whatever the case may be. If they have inconsistent income, they would need to use the declaration of employment form. And I think I see some questions. Hang on just a second. If a child is eligible in one district and moves to your district in the same school year and they are no longer eligible because of a new job, is there a way for us to still accept the child or claim them as eligible? So the rule that we have is once a child is determined eligible and they are in the LA4 program, we don't go back and verify income again. Um, if your district has a different rule and you choose to verify income if a child transfers in from another LA4 program, that's up to you. But um, for as far as our rule is concerned, if they are transferring from one LA4 program to your LA4 program, then they've already been determined eligible and you would not have to determine it again. Age requirements, parents, who want to wait a year and send their child a year later. You, yeah, so the age requirement is actually in statute. So there is not, we don't have the ability to waive the age requirement. So they have to be legally one year younger than the eligibility age for kindergarten is how the, the law reads. 
So they have to be one year younger than five by September 30th. So unfortunately, we can't waive that for LA4. Um, they Now you can waive that within your district if you have some other funding source that you want to use or if um, or you're one of those, you know, if you're a district that charges tuition, you're welcome to, but as far as LA4 goes, they have to be set, they have to be four by September 30th. Is there an age limit for using the no income form? If they are an adult over the age of 18, living in the household and being included in the household number, then they have to have some sort of documentation ending, indicating um, that they have no income or that they don't contribute financially. And this is for audit purposes. So if there's a child at home that's 18 and doesn't, you know, is still in school and doesn't work, um, they could just include a statement of no income for that, for that child. And you would need to verify that the child's, yeah, you would definitely want to verify that the child was eligible for LA4 in the previous district, absolutely. Okay, I think we can go to the next one, Amanda. So a couple of things about check stubs. I know we cover this every year, but this is one of the trickier parts, I think, um, to calculating and verifying eligibility correctly when you have check stubs. There's a couple of things to note about check stubs. You should collect the two most recent consecutive check stubs for each parent or caregiver in the home for the current year. Their pay dates should fall within two months from the date they are completing the application. If there are any other adults living in the home, you can, um, if they don't contribute direct financial support to the family, that's when you would get a statement of no income for any additional adults. Income verification is only based on the regular or base pay. We do not include overtime, tips, extra pay for night shifts, housing allowances, et cetera, as these are not considered regular or guaranteed. So this is why you will see that the hourly rate for their, their regular hourly rate of pay is the most consistent method of calculating income. We only wanna look at what their guaranteed um, rate of pay is. Eligibility is based on gross household income. So if there are two or more adults contributing to the financial needs of the family, all of them must provide proof of income. So if mom and dad and the child live with the grandma and the grandma helps them pay their bills, you would need to get the grandma's income as well. And we've had some questions about this come up in the past. So a couple of scenarios that will maybe offer some clarification. Like I just said, if a mom and her two children live with her parents, but she is working and financially supporting herself and the kids, her parents do not provide direct financial support. You would only include the mom and her children in the household size. So if they do not provide direct support, you can either get the statement of no income or you just don't include them in the household size. However, if she lives with her parents and they do provide direct financial support, you would either have them verify how much per month they provide to her and count it as her income, or you would include them in the family size and collect their income in addition to the mother's. So if you have any other questions about this, please feel free to email them to me or give me a call. Um, some of these things are, are look, you have to look at them on a case by case basis. And so if there's ever one that trips you up and you need to talk through it, we can absolutely do that. Okay, these are the new income limits for 2021-2022. Um, and we are gonna go through one example um, using this chart. So let's see, the next one, Amanda. This is the same chart you see every year. This is how you should calculate uh, a check stub based on a family's pay period. 
Okay, we can move to the next one. Okay, like I said, income is most consistently and accurately calculated using the hourly, hourly rate formula. In addition, you must always assume that an employee works a 40 hour work week and calculate it as such. So let me say that one more time. You must always assume that an employee works a 40 hour work week um, and calculate their check stub as such. Even if it says they only worked 14 hours, we have to assume a 40 hour work week unless we get something from their employer that says otherwise. So if Ms. Smith comes to you and she has a check stub showing an hourly rate of $25 and she is a single parent and has one child, you would calculate it as $25 an hour times 40 hours per week times 4.33, which would make her income 4330. And for a family of two, she is over income. So you can see that she would not be eligible, but she claims she does not work 40 hours a week. So you would need to get a letter from her employee indicating the number of hours she does work. And she provides a letter from her employer showing that she only works 20 hours per week. You can recalculate her income at $25 an hour times $20, 20 hours per week times 4.33, which equals 2165, which then does make her child eligible. Are there any questions about that? I know we go over the same thing every year, so y'all are probably like, let's talk about something new. It's good practice, Lindsay. So, <laughs> and your, your your little caveat about the forty hours a week, and you have to calculate that because you need to. Um, that's just a good reminder. So, okay, SNAP benefits. So, uh, Lindsay, just a reminder too. We only have three minutes left. Okay. Oh, I'm so sorry. Okay, I think I'm almost done. Okay, so. SNAP benefits, if you can't match them to indirect match, there are two documents you can look for. The SNAP change closure letter that the family gets, which will indicate their certified uh, certification dates and will have the household members listed. You have to make sure the child is on there. And they can also print out their case detail report um, from their cafe portal. This is something they can actually pull up on their smartphone and you can get a screenshot of it and just um, keep it on file. But their food stamps card is not actually an accepted um, document to prove income because it doesn't have any expiration dates on it. Okay, next one. Um, these are things that are not allowable. If all they have, um, if they have check stubs or if they have some other form of income, please try not to use tax forms if you can help it. We can't accept Medicaid documentation. If they are matched using Medicaid and direct match, that's okay. But if they have just a Medicaid card, we cannot use that because there are varying um, income limits within Medicaid programs. And child support as an independent source should not be used unless it is the sole source of income and is court ordered. And they must provide the court documents um, that go along with it to show that income. And um, my next few slides were about uh, immunizations. We can skip, we can skip that one. I do really quickly wanna talk about kids who are not immunized. Immunization requirement, immunization is not required for eligibility. It is required for school entry, but if kids do not have their shots, it does not mean that they can't go to school. There are some options for them. So if they can't afford to pay for shots, here is a link to Shots for Tots where you can direct them. If a child has never been vaccinated, but the parents would like for them to, there is an accelerated schedule for children um, who, have, who are starting their immunizations late. That is also linked here, and you should ask your pediatrician for more information. And if a child is unvaccinated due to medical, religious, or philosophical beliefs, it is allowed within the law. And we have linked here our statement of exemption form that should be signed by the parent. If you have any questions about eligibility determination, feel free to move to the next slide, Amanda. You can reach out to me um, or you can reach out to Amanda if, if I'm unavailable and one of us will get you the answer that you're looking for. All right, so we got a question from Rachel. She says, are we being paid for enrolled kids for the rest of the year? Are slots yes. given? Right. So from August through December, you were paid based on your total allocation. 
beginning in January, you will be paid for children you actually have enrolled. Um, this does not, we're not looking at attendance. We are just looking at the number of kids who are enrolled. And that includes children enrolled in person and children enrolled in virtual programs. So if you have kids that meet LA4 eligibility requirements, please make sure that you um, include them on your enrollment report if you're not already funding them through another funding source. So um, I know we have a couple more slides left, but um, I don't think the rest of um, the deck or the presentation has um, super pressing. Um, we had the license restructure. Um, Meredith, was there anything pressing here that you really have to go over? No, ma'am, it's just a reminder from um, last week. Okay. Um, and budget updates, um, I can go over a little bit more later next week. I really feel like I wanna just give you um, your time. <laughs> so um, I wanna jump to the end and just kind of show you the end, your um, events and deadlines. And then we will send out this, this um, presentation and a recording so that you can have both and um, we'll send that out um, probably tomorrow. It takes about 24 hours for us to get the recording together. So we'll definitely send that out um, as soon as possible. Um, thank you so much. Um, sorry for not being able to cover the last part, but a lot of that was covered last week and with um, a follow-up email. So again, um, wanna be respectful for your time. Oh, there's just a few more questions. If you need to go, you may um, certainly, you know, hop off right now. If you want to um, hear the, the remaining of these questions, you can certainly stay on. So Sorens is asking, will LEAs and or lead agencies be asked to help coordinate vaccines for childcare teachers? So Sorens, this question, um, we talked about a little bit last week, and this is um, being communicated to, to the school systems and we just wanted to share that information. So um, we're not asking, we're just sharing the same information that the school systems are being given as well. We would like that, um, that the same equitable information and is being um, disseminated to childcare and early childcare in the networks. So, um, but the ask is that, um, that you figure out what is going to work best for your um, community network. And um, we can kind of go over that some more and figure out what's going to work best for your network. All right, and then next week we can dig a little bit more into that. I can answer Lola's question. Lola, will we receive the, oh yeah, Lola, um, yeah. The new family eligibility worksheet um, will be posted on the website and available tomorrow. And I believe um, once this um, webinar wraps up, we will have a link to it and we will send it out to you with the, uh, with the family eligibility worksheet attached as well. So vaccine information was shared um, via the superintendent information and school system and from calls. And all right, is there any other questions? Did we miss anything? All right, thank you so much, guys. You have a great afternoon.